Um, thanks for joining us all on, on your, uh, what might be a lunch break uh, to hear more about uh, the Codex Institute. Um, just one, the purpose of this institute or the purpose of this session really is just to, you know, give, give information about uh, what the Summer Institute is, what the process uh, looks like for submitting proposals, what the review process is, and just to give you a sense of what it might look like to, to, to be there, what it looks like. We've done one of these so far. Um, not exactly uh, the way that we originally conceived of it, but um, but it it seemed to go it seemed to go well. So we want to give folks a, a good sense of what it what it uh, what it's like, and we also have a couple colleagues here who were uh, at the institute last year, and I've invited them to kind of speak to their experiences. Uh, Codex sort of emerged from um, a previous uh, series of grants, actually from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, that were. Um, originally awarded to the to the libraries of the five colleges of Ohio. Some, most of you may be familiar with these, but these were really intended to help, um, you know, kind of explore what digital scholarship and digital humanities uh, could look like in a liberal arts setting. Um, and so, not surprisingly, you know, our efforts really ended up focusing primarily on uh, the connection between um, uh, digital collections and digital pedagogy. And I think one of the big takeaways from from the from those experiences were that you know incorporating a, a digital project into an existing class, let alone you know creating an entirely new class, uh, you know in many ways changes the way that the class is is taught. Um, and often you know these these experiences, you know folks who have gone through these experiences, and I think we'll you know hear from some today, you know often you know require one or two or three iterations of a project in order for it to feel sort of like baked into the class. Um, uh, you know, more so than kind of being an add-on. And um, so what, what Codex really arrived, you know, arose to kind of meet this um, uh, concern or this need to be, you know, thinking a little bit more about the design of the, of the course itself or the design of the project itself uh, and less a little less about, you know, what is it that we want to build? Like, what is the project we want to build? And more on, like, why do we want to build it? Uh, what are the goals? And how do we design that course or that project to, to really help meet those goals? And, uh, you know, one of the big takeaways from these previous grants was that a lot of these projects, the successful ones tended to be team-based, uh, involving collaborators from, uh, you know, from the faculty, from the libraries, uh, from the educational technologists, from students. Uh, and so we've really kind of embraced that team model and taken that to this institute. Um, so the home base for Codex is uh, codex.ohio5.org. Um, I'll just call attention to, to a couple things here. Um, the about page, of course, uh, kind of describes the, the project in general. And there are a lot of components to Codex, uh, the institute being the primary engine for it. Um, not all of these exist uh, outside of being on paper, uh, but we have slowly started to fold uh, in uh, these elements and they have started to become reality. Uh, including the Institute. Um, the, the Institute itself is uh, really uh, for teams. And so we are inviting teams of faculty, librarians, technologists, students to come to this Institute and spend you know, a series of days working together and with other teams to uh, design these courses and these projects uh, together. Um, the other element that we've uh, incorporated this year um, is a microgrant program. The microgrant program is um, a, a small award uh, that's designed to support to support the continued development of projects that are designed at Codex. Uh, small awards of up to about a thousand dollars that can support a variety of expenses, including uh, student wages uh, for those who are interested in hiring uh, student assistants uh, and so on. Um, at the end of the uh, institute, um, you know, kind of what what folks are working towards is not a you know polished digital project in, in the end necessarily. Uh, but is a sort of curricular package. So a package of, uh, you know, materials that it might include a syllabus, uh, might include um, uh, assignment descriptions, uh, assessment uh, instruments or, or grading rubrics, uh, and prototypes of digital, uh, digital projects, and any documentation that, um, you know, might be developed in the course of designing the project. And uh, the teams are actually encouraged and kind of expected to share uh, those curricular packages, um, you know, following their, uh, not, not immediately following the Institute, but following the, uh, you know, teaching of the course or leading that project. And, you know, assuming that it's going to take at least one pass through to kind of finalize, you know, what those, uh, what those look like. Um, 
the uh, other kind of news about Codex that's relatively new for, especially for anyone who's been, you know, involved or following it, um, is that in June of last year, in the midst of uh, pandemic, uh, you know, we we uh, received a grant from the uh, William and uh, Flora Hewlett Foundation, and the primary interest of the Hewlett Foundation in this work uh, really has to do with understanding more about the impacts on student learning for those students who are engaged in these sort of more hands-on uh, project-based collaborative uh, digital projects and what it you know sort of what the impacts are um, what the open nature of these projects them being released openly um, has on their engagement in this in the course subject material as well as the engagement with the technologies itself um, so as part of that uh, grant, we have started to incorporate a, um, uh, so some elements of research so to, to help contribute to this sort of larger um, uh, you know, investigation into impacts on student learning. And so uh, along with participation in the Institute, we also are incorporating uh, a pre and post Institute uh, survey of attendees. Um, as well as a small set of uh, sort of student reflection questions. And we're asking each team to incorporate these reflection questions, which are just asking, you know, very open-ended questions of students who participate in these projects. Um, and also a post-course or a post-project uh, uh, survey of the faculty member involved and the staff uh, involved in, uh, in those projects. Um, so we're, you know, we're, again, we're, we're one institute through. Uh, so we hope, you know, by, uh, by three years down the road, which is actually what this grant supports, that we might have actually been able to uh, learn something and uh, be able to share that, you know, with a uh, more global community. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more later about the proposal guidelines and logistics, like what does this institute feel like, what does it look like, but I, I guess I first want to just turn it over to a couple colleagues that have joined us here just to talk about their projects um, specifically, but also their experiences with the, the institute last year. Um, and while we do that, I'm going to kind of probably turn uh, the sharing over to, to them, but I'll uh, start by just mentioning them and allow them to introduce themselves. Um, so from uh, Oberlin College, uh, we're joined by uh, Larissa Fakit and uh, Abby Aresti, who are going to share a little bit more about a project called the Artifact Project. And then also from Ohio Wesleyan, uh, Stephanie Merkel uh, to talk about uh, some of her work at the Institute. And if she's interested in sharing um, some reflections on um, how her course went, uh, because she taught it uh, last, last semester. Um, and uh, I think she'll have a, she'll have a really good, in, some really good insight and perspective on how that went, particularly in this kind of remote and hybrid uh, environment. So, um, so Abby and uh, Larissa, I'm going to turn it to you and let you uh, introduce yourselves and, and get, us, get us started on your, on your project. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today and thank you Ben for having us um, to talk about our artifact projects, which we plan to go over um, basically where it started and how it has evolved through Codex and through COVID. Um, Abby? <laughs> For sure, I was okay. <laughs> so um, the Artifact um, project is a project we've been working on since spring 2019. You can see um, the display that we created after the first iteration of our project here. It's paired with um, Larissa's English for speakers of other languages. This, her students plus community members um, tell stories um, and bring um, build an exhibit together featuring these stories about significant objects in their lives. At least that's sort of the first couple of iterations. You could see that from the video that we just played, that was um, of course pre-COVID. Um, and when we um, applied to the Codex Institute, I think we had a number of goals in mind, um, ranging from building out a digital format of our exhibit um, to support sort of connection between project iteration so that people could listen to previous stories and, and what have you. Um, and we had goals about sort of def coming up with a mission statement and defining assessment for our project and all of these sort of aspirational goals. And I feel like um, this side that you're looking at here was sort of our second pass at goals because of course, halfway through our second iteration of the Artifact Project is when um, COVID struck and everything uh, went remote midway through the, the second iteration of the project. So as it turns out, we actually had to build our um, digital exhibit a little bit sooner than anticipated. Um, <laughs> and we built it in um, before Codex and there was no Mecca exhibit. And then, so we ended up 
instead um, thinking about um, how we were going to transition our project to a remote context because we are running our pro project in the upcoming semester. And in doing that, we, um, you know, in, in coming together in Codex, we had the time to basically think about and reflect on what, what the core components of the project were. And it was really about storytelling and community building and language learning. And so the 3D printed lithopanes, the exhibit, it was all sort of nice to have. Um, and the recording technology, all of that was really lovely, but um, wasn't sort of the core component of, of the project. And so we were trying to think about how we could actually imagine revamping the project entirely. And so this semester, we're actually going, of course, fully digital, and we're creating um, a cookbook version. So we're focusing on recipes and um, dishes and, and basically building um, using this platform called Digication to build a collaborative um, cookbook together. So we're going to be doing everything over Zoom, and we're going to have multimodal exchanges, writing, speaking, storytelling. We even are bringing in a fourth um, faculty um, partner who is in the dance department. So we're doing some movement work and simple arts and crafts. Um, and you can kind of see some of the arts and crafts style things that we're working on. So we're working on postcards on, um, on the upper right corner here, a cookbook page, um, and, and various projects um, in that vein. So um, I'll, I'll turn it back to Larissa to kind of talk about what it was like in the Codex Institute in particular and how that influenced um, some of our, our revisions. So as um, Abby had pointed out, we had many goals coming into Codex that we kind of, the great thing about Codex is we were given the time to really work on those as a team and redefine them and reprioritize them um, so that we had a clearer focus um, of what we wanted to, to do and, and to achieve. And then the added benefit is we had many open forums with our peers and they were able to share what they were doing in their projects. And that really helped us see you know, possibilities that we could include in ours, um, as well as things that maybe we had thought of and then we're like, well, maybe that isn't a great fit for, for our project. So it was really great to hear what everyone else is doing and how they were incorporating it, how they were even doing assessment in their projects. Um, we also got a lot of really great unbiased like guidance. We are so close to our project that you know we needed someone else that wasn't so close that could take a step back and redirect us where we've kind of lost our way. So that was really helpful. Um, also, as Ben had pointed out, access to the micro grant to the funding. Um, we're so grateful that we were able to hire back one of our RAs to again work with us on the project through this funding. Um, there's so many great things to talk about that we went through with Codex, but these are kind of our, our top few that we thought were, were worth mentioning. Um, we'll definitely, you know, thank you for listening and we'll, we're open to answer any questions, whether we have time later or if you want to email either Abby or I. Yeah, I think we're definitely going to leave some time at the end uh, for, for some questions. That would be a great, a great time to, to do that. Um, Sure, folks have some. Stephanie, would you like to share uh, about your your project, your experience? Um, the project that um, I worked on with my team members, uh, Eugene Rutigliano and Calvin Cleary, uh, is um, a project that um, was meant to help me uh, to revise a course that I've taught for 20 years uh, called Reason and Romanticism. Um, and I wanted to revise the course so that um, I could include more female participation in the age. Um, and often that's not caught through studying uh, public, female publication. Uh, and so we focused on letter writing. Uh, and the title of the project was um, Reconstructing Enlightened Womanhood. And uh, we wanted to use the Scalar platform to create um, media rich and um, a sort of a media rich conceptualization of female participation um, in the genre of letter writing, particularly uh, in the circle of Catherine the Great. Um, and I, um, I wanted to say something about three parts of the codex application um, that I think um, took on a little bit more um, importance um, because of the circumstances this year under which we did the project. And those three things I wanted to talk about were timeline, relevance, 
and ethical considerations. I have um, three digital projects that uh, in three different courses. Um, and this past semester, uh, while I was um, doing the uh, inaugural uh, run of my um, uh, Codex project with Eugene and Calvin, um, I, was also I also had a digital project in another class. And I wanted to say something about timeline for implementing digital projects. Um, in my two different courses, my two different projects, I have two different timelines. In the one course, uh, which is a course called Folklore for Storytellers and Gamers, my students create uh, a project, a complete project uh, within uh, the time period of, of the semester. Um, and that project is a, um, is a twine project. They create an interactive fiction game based on the study of uh, the morphology uh, of the Russian magic tale. And so they create their own game. Um, but in the Codex project that Eugene and Calvin and I did, um, the students um, began uh, a project that I will carry over into, um, into the course, uh, which I teach yearly. I teach it every fall. Um, so I think that's one thing to think about in an application. Um, are you envisioning a project that will be completed in the scope of one semester uh, as you know, a final perhaps in the course? Or are you going to set up something that is more like uh, a lab space for the course where students will, um, will add to the project uh, each time you teach the course? Um, the second thing I wanted to address in the application for the codex, um, which I didn't maybe give enough uh, attention to in the first time around, uh, uh, as I was thinking so much more about the conceptualization of the project and the, the digital platform, is relevance. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that a lot of critical thinking skills goes into uh, to this sort of a project, uh, writing, editing, um, and also, um, you know, just uh, conceptualization, being able to conceptualize and communicate uh, some complex research. But I was thinking um, after the course was over this past fall um, that there were many other skills that my students were gaining. Um, and, you know, we talk about transferable skills. I took a few of these from a list that my colleague here at Ohio Wesley and Marianne Lewis Cusato put together. But I think that in that section of the codex application relevance, you know, you can be thinking about the fact that the students are going to be doing things like, you know, learning to ask for help, uh, embracing the unexpected, being resourceful, uh, practicing empathy, uh, teaching and, and mentoring each other. Um, dealing with um, and motivating uh, team members uh, and supporting and encouraging each other. I think one thing that I learned this fall was that, um, you know, uh, digital humanities is not synonymous with, with remote learning. Some of my colleagues thought that probably it would be, you know, it was very felicitous to, to have a, a digital humanities project going, but there's definitely challenges in the environment, having some students being remote. I had some students who were uh, with me in the classroom. So those were some challenges to think about. The third thing I wanted just to say here at the end is um, I wanted to address um, ethical considerations. When I first did my application last year for the Codex grant, I was thinking um, you know, about um, notability, uh, respecting copyrights and so forth. But I think also under ethical considerations, uh, we have to think about um, uh, how we are conceiving our project um, as far as, you know, are we, are we being student centered? And that was something that uh, really came to the fore this fall. Um, in reading Catherine's letters, there's one letter uh, that I can quote just briefly. Catherine is writing to Voltaire and um, Voltaire is, um, disappointed that she has not succeeded in abolishing serfdom. And Catherine replies to him that she's working on human skin, which will bear 
uh, a lot a lot less than um, than paper. And I, I think that's one thing to remember as you design your project, your codex project, that particularly in the present environment uh, that we are working on, students can. And um, that was something I I had to think about. And I think with digital humanities projects, in particular, uh, they are ways that we can very um, um, easily communicate to other divisions the relevance of what we do in humanities. Um, uh, but we also need to think about uh, the fact that the projects, after all, right, are, are student-centered. Um, and I think that um, that's something to consider when you do your application. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions about any of my di digital projects in my course. Um, and you can contact me uh, through the Ohio Wesleyan website, Stephanie Merkel. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, yeah, it was it was uh, thrilling for me. Um, although you know, sometimes I like to get my hands in there, and I, in some some ways, I wished I uh, could be members of your projects. But it was still thrilling to watch them and help help them grow uh, to where they are, and and will be, too. Um, well, thank you both. Yeah, we'll we'll. I, I hope we have some questions, and we'll. Um, I, I promise not to take up too much more time. I just want to make sure I, I convey uh, information and point you all in the right in the right place. And I'm going to remove that. Okay. Um, I'm going to just point you all back quickly to the Codex website, and uh, then we'll, we'll open it up to questions here in just a moment. Okay. Um, first thing I wanted to share, just, you know, we've heard from two, two of the teams here, but there were um, five others uh, that you can learn about if you're interested uh, on the Codex website. Uh, at the top, there's a Summer Institute menu. Uh, we now have entries for two institutes, and last year's is under 2020, obviously. Um, and for each one of these, um, there is a uh, short, uh, approximately 10 minute um, video of, from each project because at the end of the Institute, uh, we all kind of come, come together at the end and uh, share, uh, share how the week went, right? At the beginning of the week, we kind of have a session where we talk about what the goals are for the week. And at the end, we, we kind of reflect on where we are, where each team is. And so these uh, short videos are, um, those final kind of presentations uh, at the end. And so those will just those are just a good way of, of uh, getting a better sense of what kinds of projects uh, were attended last year. Um, the other uh, thing I really want to point to though is the 2021 Institute where we have uh, kind of documented all of the details and guidelines for the call of proposals for this year. Uh, the deadline for that is February 28th. And if I didn't mention it yet, um, really what, what comes with a you know, selected proposal is um, you know, an institute that's actually really designed for the spe specifically for the, co the cohort that uh, is, is coming, right? So we offer workshops. Uh, those workshops ultimately are available. And I think some of you attended them um, to anyone from the Ohio Five, although they, they're selected and designed um, specifically for this cohort. Uh, so it's really about trying to support these, you know, these specific teams. Um, each, each member of each team also receives a $1,000 stipend. And then I also mentioned uh, each team has an option to accept a uh, microgrant award of up to $1,000. That'll be new. Uh, that is actually new. Um, when we conceived of microgrants, we hadn't, uh, we originally thought of that as just, you know, we're, we have this uh, resource that anyone can apply for. Uh, but we also really want to support these codex teams that are going through the effort of putting a proposal together, spending a week together, and you know teaching these courses. Uh, so we've made that just sort of built into the to the institute. So it's an, an additional uh, element this year. Um, I just wanted to the, all of the guidelines are here. I do want to call attention to a couple of them, and uh, in addition to those that uh, Stephanie mentioned, uh, just to just to kind of highlight a few things um, in the in the first section. Uh, not title, but uh, description and goals. Um, you know, what, what, what's really important here is really like, how does this project support your, your teaching, your pedagogical, goal, pedagogical goals? How is it going to uh, impact students? You know, Stephanie emphasized the, the student-centeredness of this, and that's kind of what we really want to, to hear about. Um, so what are the goals and, you know, what is it about, like, what is it about the digital nature of this proposal that is really important and that will actually help achieve the goals. Again, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of um, 
very interesting and, and mostly rewarding projects, uh, digital projects, but, but sometimes if not kind of woven into a course can feel like a little bit of an add-on, um, you know, and maybe disconnected from the course uh, objectives themselves in some ways, feedback that we've heard. Um, so that's just sort of like the why, why digital? Why do you want to do this digitally? You know, that's sort of a very important question that the reviewers are very interested in hearing about. The other um, element that we've added this year, and it's partially because of the uh, grants that we received to help support the Institute for this year and the next uh, uh, three years, is about the open nature of projects. Um, so uh, last year we didn't require this, but this year we are going to require that uh, the, the outcomes of, of the work, uh, mean, being this curricular package that I described earlier, so this, you know, syllabi, if it's a course, uh, any assignments that are developed uh, collaboratively, assessments, rubrics, prototypes, and so on, that that sort of package of materials is shared openly. Um, the student work, not necessarily uh, open. Some, there, sometimes there are very good reasons not to share uh, student work openly. Um, but uh, you know, reflecting on what, what are the potential impacts uh, or benefits of sharing that. And for those uh, projects that, that do have an open component to them for students, uh, you know, how does that impact how they engage in the project? We know that, for example, um, you know, writing, for example, for a public audience, uh, sometimes has a, a, you know, raises the accountability that students tend to feel um, in, in completing those assignments. Just one example, but there could be many others. Um, the, these proposals, I'll, I'll move on to the next section, team members. Um, these proposals, we, you know, we wanna see that they're coming from, from teams, um, but uh, the format of a team is, we're not prescribing what, what a team looks like. We know that that could be very different and they have been very different, uh, you know, across the, the teams that we've seen so far. Uh, but, you know, think about this, right? So is it, could it be other, other faculty uh, at other institutions? Could it be uh, students? Could it be uh, educational technologists, librarians, you know, and so on? Like, who, who is your team? And you may not know that. Um, and so I think, you know, for this, uh, if you are considering a proposal for this year, um, you know, you might, and we actually worked with some of the proposers last year, applicants last year, um, to encourage them before, you know, before we could make a decision that we really wanted to see that they had a conversation with their team about, you know, what, what, what they were going, how, you know, like, how was each team member going to be contributing? What were their roles, you know, in the project? So if you're not sure who your team is, I would, I would encourage you to reach out to colleagues like in the library or uh, technologists. If you have uh, some enterprising students that you, um, uh, that you know of, um, you know, have a conversation about about that, and you know, try to try to understand who's, you know, what the roles are, and and uh, you know, what that collaboration looks like. Um, other areas I just want to call attention to because they they were um, areas that folks um, struggled with a little bit last year, and so I wanted to maybe clarify these uh, a little bit. Uh, the last uh, some of the last elements here: sustainability, accessibility. Uh, we, we have sustainability here because, uh, you know, I, I can, I don't have enough fingers to count the number of projects that have been developed. And then, you know, after that course was taught or after the project was over, the project kind of, you know, uh, whittled, um, whittled away uh, and, and, you know, uh, and died because there wasn't, you know, a good plan for how to sustain it. And sometimes that's okay. If that's the intention, that's fine, as long as it's sort of intended uh, for, for that to happen. So we don't expect everyone to come with, to, in the proposal to come with a full-on sustainability plan, uh, because frankly, a lot of that work will happen at the Institute and thinking about that. And maybe you're, you know, not in the, uh, maybe you're not the strongest in that area. And maybe one of your collaborators has a perspective that, you know, can be helpful here. Um, but what we do want to see is just that you've, you know, given some thought to some of the issues that might present challenges to the sustainability of this, of this project. It might be um, the labor involved in developing it. It might be the labor involved in teaching it. It might be, you know, a whole other number of things. It could be technical, could be uh, interpersonal and so on. So just giving some thought to, to that. And accessibility also uh, very important since uh, many of these projects are producing um, digital resources that are going on the web. Uh, we want to make sure that those resources are in fact accessible to those um, who may have uh, disabilities, who may be in areas that and are challenged uh, by access to technology. Um, uh, and there are a number of guidelines and so on out there that, that uh, uh, web accessibility guidelines and a number of other um, 
accessibility resources to, to consult there. Again, we don't expect to, everyone to have all of the answers for how uh, they will ensure accessibility, but again, just evidence that you've given some thought to what the primary issues might be uh, that you, you'd need to consider. Um, the last one I'll mention here is just that last uh, question, why Codex? Like, why is it important uh, for you to bring your team to this institute, working, along, uh, working alongside other teams uh, in this consortial you know, setting, as opposed to just you know, setting aside some time on your home campus and you know, developing this together? You know, why, why Codex? Why this particular institute? I think that's, that's also really important, something we wanna, we wanna hear about. Um, okay, uh, then lastly, I'll, I'll just say I, I have a, um, a partner in crime in all of this. Uh, I am the, one of the co-directors of the Summer Institute. Heather Fitzgibbon is, is also um, the, she's the other co-director. Heather is a professor of uh, sociology at the College of Worcester. Um, and she and I have been working on this together for some time. And so we're both available to, to anyone uh, interested um, in talking about their ideas. If uh, you're not, sure, again, like if you're not sure who your team is, if you have an idea that's sort of roughly formed and just wanna, wanna think through that together, uh, we are available and very willing to, to talk to you. Uh, and you know, we'll point you in any direction we can to be as helpful as we can. Um, the deadline for the proposals is February 28th, uh, and we will have a review committee that is representative of the colleges, uh, as well as the various sort of stakeholder groups that we, you know, uh, are, are, are the, the faculty, the, the librarians, technologists, and, and so on. Um, and we expect uh, deadlines the 28th, we expect uh, to be able to uh, notify uh, teams by the 31st of March. We are proceeding with a virtual format. This was all conceived originally as a very face-to-face -face, uh, environment, but obviously given where we are and not knowing where we'll be uh, this summer specifically, we have made the decision to proceed virtually, although we aren't ruling out the possibility of some kind of face-to-face -face component if that possibility is, is there uh, in July when this, when this institute will happen. Um, okay, so I will, I'm going to stop talking there. And uh, I, I guess I also wanted to invite, you know, others who are on this call who um, were at Codex and part of Teams. I, I saw Joe and Alex. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you have thoughts that you'd like to share about your experiences too, I, I, you know, I think that would benefit the group. Uh, and I'm going to stop sharing here for a minute. And it's okay if you don't uh, want to share, uh, just, just you know, thumbs down and we can, <laughs> we can just open it up for other questions too. That's fine. Hi, I was raising my hand, but I, I wasn't oh. sure if you could see me. I wasn't sure how you wanted to field questions. Um, I, I was a little late, so I apologize. You probably did introductions. I, I'm at Ohio Wesleyan in the history department. And um, a couple of my questions have to do with uh, the team aspect of it. Um, one question is, can a team member repeat uh, if they participated in one summer institute? And so specifically, I have in mind Stephanie's um, team included two librarians. One's kind of our digital go-to person and the other is content person mm -hmm. for your field. So are there limitations on including um, repeat team members? That would be question one. And then my second question is, um, is this limited to full-time faculty? Could an adjunct, uh, let's, you know, particularly an adjunct who is regularly teaching a catalog course is there any any um, you know restriction about that? Yeah, that so that I can answer the I can answer both. Um, yeah, the first one, no no limitations on on repeat. Uh, in fact, we we even in, we even expected there to be cases where um, you had uh, someone that was actually on two teams. Um, Possibly, uh, just because you know we have some folks on campus, and I, I know I think I know who you're referring to uh, at Ohio Wesleyan, um, who maybe are the, the sort of like the lone person in that area with that expertise, and are often uh, consulted for for various things, and so um, no limitations there. Um, I think primarily, you know, it would be down to the the team members' availability, but no, but no limitations in the program itself. Um, the other one, yeah, we, we do have to give uh, like consideration to the, you know, visiting or adjunct faculty. Uh, just really, you know, the purpose of this is to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to support courses that will continue to be taught in this way. And so I, I wouldn't say no, uh, but I would say the, 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 um, as you said, you know, this is a course that is, you know, retaught. Uh, so I think that would be an important consideration. Uh, oh, and I'm actually getting a, 
a colleague joining the meeting, Heather, right now. Uh, good. Anyway, I, I would say uh, that would be very important to, to mention, um, you know, the, and, and will this structure or this element or this project be, uh, you know, can continue to be like an important part of that course? And if the answer to that is yes, I think the reviewers would have to, would have to consider that. So here we go. Uh, Christina, thank you. There you go. There we go. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. It, um, I'm Christina Boganov. I teach at Ohio Wesleyan as well. I'm in the arts and I really want to thank everyone for sharing their uh, projects and thoughts and ideas. This was very helpful. Um, I, I have a question. Um, I hope it will make sense and it is geared to uh, Larissa and Abby about their project, the, um, the artifact. So you mentioned the production of lithophanes. Um, so I'm assuming that was done with the three, you know, 3D technology basically. So, so when, when, you, when you envisioned your project, um, did you um, basically knew that that type of equipment exists in Oberlin? So you could, you could kind of budget it in or kind of know that that, it, that is what we would use. Um, and I guess for Ben, um, you know, this grant is not something where a school or a team would acquire certain certain um, equipment, let's say, but it is more, let's say, if, um, is it possible that if a team makes a proposal, but maybe not completely sure whether certain equipment exists around the consortium, around the, you know, uh, our schools, is it possible to then team up with that school and perhaps use that certain equipment? So that, that's kind of my question. Mm -hmm. I hope it makes sense. Uh, uh, Larissa and Abby, do you want to speak to the first part of that? I think I'll let Abby answer this one because okay. the idea of artifact came out of a potpourri, so. <laughs> um, yeah, no, in fact, um, on our first slide, there was a list of all of the different partners. So Larissa and I are just part of the team and we have a colleague who um, directs the Cooper International um, Learning Center on campus, which is the language lab on campus, who um, has a very, a fleet of 3D printers at this point because he's taught um, a winter term where people actually build 3D printers, um, some of which they keep themselves and some of which they donate. And so um, part of, yeah, part of, he had already started just printing lithopanes. And, and so the idea for Artifact came as sort of the intersection of storytelling and this, this cool thing that he was doing. So yeah, we did know about that. Yeah, and I, I can speak to the other part of that. I think, um, and to be clear too, the, the, this is a, I, I would hesitate to call this, this program a grant, uh, except for the micro grant, the smaller award that kind of comes along with, uh, with Codex, because really like <clears throat> the, the funds involved here are really to compensate folks for their time. You know, it's a lot of time. Uh, so there is that thousand dollar stipend um, that, that comes with attending this week long institute together. Um, and so I think for there to be like the, a dependency on a particular technology, um, I think the proposal would have to demonstrate that there's a strong likelihood that that is available or you know, uh, could, could become available by the time you know the institute happens, or as, particularly if there needed to be some kind of you know hands-on experimentation with that technology, or um, you know trying to figure out ways of incorporating it into the into the class or the project, um, you know the the micro grant that's that's designed to support the project um, could can be used uh, to fund technology purchases. That's not its only purpose, but that certainly can be used. Um, but of course, the amount of that has limitations given you know the kinds of technologies that you're you might be considering but it can be used uh, for that purpose um, there are really few limitations on what that the funds can can be used for although we do want to see that they're you know being used to support the goals of the the, uh, the project and also there is this element of um uh what we've been calling sort of critical digital engagement uh you know um like in, a, in addition to just incorporating technology into the classroom or into the teaching, it's sort of like, what, what does that technology allow you to do and how does it impact um, the way that, uh, you know, uh, one's, uh, one engages with the subject or does it open doors or paths to um, thinking about 
how uh, thinking about that technology itself and critiquing that technology itself and its impact on, um, uh, you know, it's, it has to be sort of tied to the course goals, obviously, but, um, you know, uh, turning that critical lens on the technology itself is something that's also of interest. So, I know that's kind of a rambling answer, but I, I, I hope it No, no, hope it I think it was helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you sure. all, actually. Thanks. And uh, this yeah. is Rick. Barbara. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, um, again. Oh. So again, I'm, I'm still thinking about teams. Is there a preference for, and I haven't carefully read the application, so this may be addressed in there, the ap application guidelines. Is there a preference for um, uh, multiple departments being involved and or interdisciplinary? So, I mean, I've got a couple of classes in mind. Um, one might be, you know, more beneficial to the history department, but the history department as a whole, not mm -hmm. simply my classes, the other, but I could try to think in terms of, well, if we did this for our class, required class for majors, you know, research class, for example, maybe it would be useful for another department and I should be reaching out to them now. Mm -hmm. Th there's not a requirement. Uh, I think there is, there's encouragement. And I think that would, uh, I think there is a note in the, in the call um, that says specifically something to the effect of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the interdisciplinarity is, is, does, is not always the case with these projects, but it, it certainly like, it certainly lends itself to that. And, but it's not a requirement. Uh, it is encouraged, but not, not, I mean, another interesting question would be, um, uh, you know, are there opportunities to collaborate across campuses, um, you know, with, with colleagues in those departments at, at other campuses as well. And this could be that space where that, you know, could happen. Uh, those are really hard, um, but, <laughs> but we have seen it. And we'll be looking in the uh, structuring of the team. Have you put together um, the people you need to make this work? I mean, mm -hmm. that's what we're, we're really looking at. And is this going to be sustainable? Are you going to be able to continue it from year to year? Um, and the really awesome ones, you have the people in place, you need to do this. Um, you can imagine doing this um, uh, from semester to semester and others can learn from the project. And that's what makes you know, the, the interdisciplinary. So you, thinking about the methods course, that might make it um, stronger in the sense that others could borrow that same mm -hmm. kind of uh, model that you're using. But you may not be there now, right? Now it may make sense to stay within the course you teach because you've got to figure out what you're doing. And we recognize that. So yeah. no, we're not going to be pushing folks to build an open source model that all history programs across the college can use now. Um, that would be awesome, but most of us aren't in that place yet. So build the team that helps you do your work mm -hmm. to make the project succeed. Yeah. Yeah, and I think hearing, like hearing from Stephanie's experiences too, I mean, I think yeah, it, I mean, it takes a few rounds, you know, to, yeah, to get yeah. it right. Yeah, the, the digital project that I, I do in my folklore course where the students create an interactive fiction game you know, based on Russian magic tales, that started on paper mm -hmm. three years ago. And then, you know, with, with Eugene's help and, um, you know, we worked it up. And so over the course of three times teaching the class, we got to this last semester where I ended up with 13 fabulous games mm -hmm. you know, that, are, uh, you know, that can be cached on the department's website. So, but that, that was three times teaching that class. Mm -hmm. I know to be kind of patient and the students realize that they're sort of building on, you know, they're on the shoulders of other people. And I try to preserve their participation in the project by keeping their names in there. So from year to year, uh, so you know, we give credit to them, but, but yeah, it can take a couple times um, and it gets richer each time. And I want to mention too about, about the, like kind of the scope of, of some of the projects, you know, in some cases, the, the, the idea that the team is working on a codex is um, like really the, I think you said this Stephanie yesterday when we talked, but sort of like the, the bones of the whole course, like the, the course is sort of, you know, structured around, uh, you know, various milestones in the project or, or, or something like that. In other cases, it, um, it might just be like a module. Um, you know, that's developed for a part of the course. And one of our, um, some of our colleagues at Worcester last year came uh, 
actually uh, an, interdis an interdisciplinary team from history and English and libraries came um, to develop a module uh, uh, kind of focus on data literacy for humanists that they intend to incorporate into a couple classes, um, specific classes, but also, you know, intend to open that up, um, you know, and make it available to, to anyone, you know, who might have that need since it's sort of a, um, I wouldn't say universal, but certainly, you know, uh, adaptable to other, other classes. So not the whole class, but just, you know, a, a component of it is something that, that can be considered too. And in some, and in other cases, there it, it's not really tied to a course at all. Um, like um, we have a, a Denison colleague, Hanada Al Nasri, who who kind of expanded an oral history project that um, really was focused more on a small team of students, uh, but that's something that she's incorporating in into her teaching uh, over time. But the project that was there was really about like developing this oral history project, um, so that that the project could be a resource for other classes. Uh, so there's just lots of flexibility in the in the scope uh, of the projects. Other questions? Zachariah? <laughs> Someone call on me? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I keep, I mean, my questions are a little more specific. I mean, most of these questions have been helpfully kind of macro. <laughs> So, I mean, there are various things I'd love to pick Stephanie's brains about, but I keep waffling over whether I want to do that. Like, <laughs> but I guess the questions that are maybe most transferable are, um, how long do you, did it take for you to get comfortable working with Twine and how did that compare with Scalar? And then what about your <laughs> students, right? I mean, I think that's, because I've been thinking of, I mean, first of all, I just think the way, the pairing of, um, like Voltaire's encyclopedia with Wikipedia just makes so much sense. And I'm also really impressed by the matching of probes, like narrative functions to the idea of a branching. I mean, it just seems like a really great fit and it's really exciting. But um, I mean, for 10 years now, my major inhibition is just like, God, I like, am I gonna bite off another project? <laughs> so if you have some short answer to that, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I think, um... I mean, for me, it's funny that part of the application that accessibility, I know Ben, you and Heather, you, I know you mean accessibility to people with disabilities, but I, I, over the last year, I've been thinking about that section too and thinking, you know, accessibility, you know, I'm more also thinking about accessibility of the ideas mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. students. So yeah. I have 100 level students in the course where I teach Vladimir Probst morphology and you know, uh, you want to bring them into that. And, and I think that, you know, Twine was a great way to do it just because uh, Eugene could, could do two sessions, you know, one in you know, week three and one in week six and, and, and teach them that very easily. It doesn't involve um, you know, coding per se. And, and, you know, they could easily pick it up. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the keys to sort of, buy-in for the students is that the digital platform, the project that I designed was closely connected to um, you know, the content of the course, of, of sort of like the major theoretical underpinnings of the course. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And your like your proposal was particularly strong in that, you know, why digital? Um, because because the 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 Wikipedia component and the uh, scalar component, you know, really spoke to the goal, you know, your goals and the, and, and the, the as, as you just said, Zach, I mean, sort of like those, those made sense. You know, we understood the connection between those, those two things pretty clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Zach, uh, I mean, I'm always happy to, to chat about more specific ideas, specific questions. And I know Eugene uh, locally will be certainly helpful. Well, two, helpful two sessions, two mm -hmm. sessions run by somebody else sounds fine. Um, <laughs> what about Scalar? I mean, um, I, I would imagine that's a bigger undertaking. I could probably speak to that too, but it's, unless Stephanie, you want to do, did you have uh, thoughts about that too? I know you, you've worked on incorporating that this semester. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, it's key to have someone on your team mm -hmm. like Eugene, mm -hmm. <laughs> who just, you know, that he was really a critical person on the team. Mm -hmm. so, uh, 
uh, I attended the Scalar Workshop through Codex at Oberlin uh, in 2019. That was also very, you know, it was just absolutely essential. Um, but, you know, having Eugene uh, on the team, you, you know, if you're not an expert in, in the platform, at, you know, you become, of course. But if you're not, you, you need to have this critical part. Of it. And especially now, because the students are, you know, they're, they're having uh, these remote sessions, right? So when Eugene comes to visit our class, it's remote, he records mm -hmm. it, we watch it, but you know, it, it just involves a lot of hands-on. And I would recommend building in to your class time, some small um, scalar assignments, mm -hmm. little tasks for them to do. Lab sessions. Right, so that you can kind of check in on them, mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, they even just the smallest thing that you maybe take for granted that they can do. Uh, inserting a little video or something to the budget, just kind of checking with them. But um, yeah, having that person on your team is key. It's absolutely mm -hmm. essential. Yeah, and I think you know one thing that that comes up a lot in the in those workshops that you mentioned, Stephanie. Um, uh, it depends on the class, but um, really, really like kind of in some ways structuring the their interaction with the platform, like being very clear about the little slice of the activity that we want to do in this, you know, on this page, rather than, you know, in other cases, though, I've seen the opposite, where it's sort of like turn them loose, and they'll learn by struggling, you know, through struggle, which <laughs> to each his or his and her own, but um, yeah, so, but I, I think, you know, giving, giving some, some good structure around, like, how, where is it, where is it important for them to, um, learn the tool and where and when is it important to like use the tool to accomplish some more content related you know goal um, and I think part of that the answer to that question I think is part can partly be answered in in a in the instant you know in sessions like at the institute you know um, you know the the week of the institute really you know there's a, a significant amount of time unstructured sort of team time right where you know there's each morning, frankly, like the, the the full morning is really devoted to just teams working together uh, and sort of planning, brainstorming discussion uh, sessions. Um, and so it's during those sessions that, that some of that planning can happen. Zach will talk. <laughs> but but I, one thing I just say, like the whole thing of the working on student skin, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, not just on paper or digitally. I mean, I really feel like this environment now is very different from digital projects I have done in courses in the past, because I feel like the students are in all classes having to learn lots of new technologies and, and platforms. And I, I really felt this semester that, you know, I was approaching, I, I felt it when I was approaching their limit. And then I had mm -hmm. to pull back a little bit and so forth. But I, I feel like, it, it, yeah, we, we have to be very sensitive about that. And they need more guidance and more, more discrete incremental well i want to be uh, respectful of everyone's time uh, we're right at one o'clock here and i uh, just wanted to thank you all for the great questions uh, and if you have any additional questions about uh, logistics or or, um, uh, or cons you know want to consult on a uh, on a proposal idea happy to to, to be there for that uh, you can contact either heather or or myself um and i uh, hope to hope to hear uh from some of your from some of you with your ideas. Yeah. Nice to be meet you if only at the end. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Take care everyone.